morning or good evening or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am here with uh, Tim Lennon, uh, and he and I will give you an update about what is new at the Drupal Association um, and specifically what's happening on Drupal.org. Um, because you're supporting partners and all of your money goes to fund the work that he and his team do, we just want to really make sure you feel connected to, to the um, area that you're investing, which is uh, so critical. So just to get started, a um, little housekeeping. Uh, if you could just remain muted during the call, um, that way we don't get background noise because we are recording this um, and we'll send out the recording in the slides to all supporters after the call. Uh, but we do want to make sure that we field your questions. Uh, so there is a chat window for questions. Uh, Tim will be watching the chat window. I can't actually see it. Um, and so he will um, stop us as we need to answer questions. Um, and as you hear things, if you like what you're hearing, feel free to tweet it out at, and make sure you tag at Drupal Association. We've got some news and uh, as I mentioned, we've got a Drupal.org update we'd like to share with you. First, I just want to thank all of you for recognizing that Drupal.org is a, a big asset for our whole community that we all benefit from. And it's so important that we give it the funding it needs to not just exist, but to evolve with all of our needs. And it's the supporting partners that are providing a very large percentage of that um, funding through this crowdsourcing model that we've come up with called the Supporting Partner Program. And um, I'm actually gonna be working on a report so you could see where funding comes from for Drupal.org and how much is coming from the supporters. It's, it's really quite impressive. And so um, we just want to say thank you for recognizing that just, you know, yes, you can download Drupal and run a company um, with free software, but you are the ones that recognize that giving back um, allows us to do more with this community site and, and you're the ones that see that it does cost money to move this forward. So, so thank you. All right, let's go to some news. Um, so on the community front, there's a couple things happening um, that I just wanted to call out the Drupal Association um, Worked with the community to help them move forward with community governance um, uh, improvements and discussions over the summer and uh, we did um, hire Whitney Hess who ran several community discussion sessions and found um, findings of areas where there's consistent people had consistency of needs of where community governance need to improve as well as she identified with the community strategies they may want to use to address those needs um, and then she also did a uh, survey with the community to find out more about what the community's needs are and how they want to move forward. Um, that work with Whitney concluded and the community working group heard the need that um, that we want to keep understanding how community governance can evolve and we want to make sure it's really owned by the community. Um, the Drupal Association is merely helping the community kind of kind of organize and um, so that they can kind of take the ball and run with it and the CWG is a community group so they heard this call this need and they are working with the community now and the next steps to really clarify the areas that um, the community wants to fix in terms of governance and we're going to hear soon about their recommendations um, and so that that process is kind of ongoing right now, but I'm really glad to see that it's it's progressing. We're really thankful for the work the community working group is doing on that front, as well as some others that have joined them um, to move community governance forward. And one of the things that we heard in terms of uh, need in the community is uh, more clarity around Dries Butart's roles. He has many roles. He's you know the benevolent benevolent dictator for life, um, which means he's really a project lead for the whole project. And of course, he has his role at Acquia, and he has a role on the Drupal Association board. And while community governance is evolving and it will impact 
um, aspects of the community, there are things within the Drupal Association, um, which only the Drupal Association has governance over and can fix. So, what, you know, we don't want to wait um, for everything to come together all at once. There are some things we can do now uh, to address the needs of the community. And um, Dries heard the call that, um, you know, one solution could be that he steps down as chairman but remains on the board in the seat that was designed for him called the founding director seat. Um, and so he has decided to go ahead and take that step. And uh, again, he will remain on the board, but in this founding director position, uh, and it is renewed every year. So it has to be voted in every year. Um, and so, you know, what that does is that he's just not driving all the agendas and managing the committees um, for the association. And so we need someone else who can do that. The community had also said that they would like to see some outside expertise come in um, and to um, have someone that's neutral and to be the chairman. And so we heard that and we uh, have asked Adam Goodman to be the chairman of the board. Adam Goodman has been advising the board for the last eight years on and off. Um, we used to be a volunteer board and now we're a strategic board. And um, he has been the one that's come in and helped to evolve this board. And while he's chairman, he will re, um, remain in that type of role. He's going to keep evolving the board and helping us orient around having a new chairman. Um, and so, of course, we will want to continue a search for a permanent chairman because Adam's playing an interim role. And um, I think it's also just important to point out that he is a paid consultant and uh, we will be paying him for this service. And we are updating the bylaws in order to accommodate that. We announced that at the last board meeting and we just wanna be really transparent about that and we'll be voting on those changes, uh, I believe at the next uh, board meeting. Um, so I think these are really positive steps. Uh, we're excited about them, but more importantly, um, it just feels good to hear the community and to make some some um, uh, improvements uh, of our own. And um, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, another thing I want to point out that we're doing is uh, hiring a community liaison. This is a specific role to help build a better relationship between the association and the community. Uh, we definitely heard the need that there needs to be more clarity and transparency, um, more engagement. Um, the community needs help understanding more about our programs, um, about our financials. There's just a lot of things. When we became a smaller organization, we really lost a lot of our um, community communication staff. And we're feeling it. I think we're all feeling it. And so this role is to fill that gap and is to foster bi-directional communication between the community um, and the Drupal Association. Um, and so you'll see this role will do things like um, be in the social channels and helping to make sure that when there's big questions out there, someone's there answering them and um, can also get a canonical space on Drupal.org to put up information about the association. So it's really easy to find. How are we performing financially now? So, uh, so many things. Um, community elections. This person can run the community elections for us and really make sure there's a transparent and clear process and lots of engagement. So I think it's going to really help build that relationship that we all want to have and help people understand that um, that the Drupal Association is here to serve the community and how we're doing. Um, and then also to be more agile, to hear the needs so that we can find new ways to serve the community. Uh, we hope to have uh, that. Megan, we have, sorry, we had one question. Okay. Um, and I think it, you, did, you did address it to some, a, certain, a certain extent. So um, Gabriel asks, will Dries need to be voted into the founding role each year? And will he, when, he, when is he announcing that decision to step into the new role? Um, you, as you already said, that role is voted on every year by the board uh, to affirm the position. Um, if it's not filled, it would stand empty because it is a seat just for the founder. 
Um, and then in terms of the decision, it was announced at the last public board meeting. So it's, it's there, it's in the recording and everything else. I don't know if we'll do additional blog posts or something like that, but. Right, we'll make sure that, um, yeah, so all of that is correct. The founding position is like where he actually sits and then you get a, kind of like appointed to chairman. Um, and, and to be very clear, it's actually called president. When you look in the bylaws, it's just that most people keep referring to him as chairman. So I'm trying not to muddy language here. Um, and the, he has always, you know, even like just last November, we did the annual voting in just to, we, we, we do, we've been maintaining that and we'll continue to do it. It's just, um, we won't be appointing him to the chairman role. Um, and yes, it has already been announced and we will continue to communicate out when um, it's all official. And we also want you to know who Adam is. So you will also see probably a blog post with some kind of interview in there as well. Um, just a little background, Adam Goodman um, is a professor at Northwestern University. Um, he is, he heads up the leadership program there. So he's an expert on leadership and advising boards and helping boards become better and organizations to become better. So, um, you know, he has no stake in Drupal. He just likes to see organizations grow and be healthy. Any other questions? Okay. Well, then I just wanted to give an update on DrupalCon Vienna. It was a very successful event with 1,600 plus attendees. Um, as you may have read or heard um, through my, uh, I think it was like a five blog post series about DrupalCon Europe that it has, uh, it has unique value. It is important. However, right now our operational model and the way that it's being um, organized right now has resulted in a loss. And when we went to, you know, work on the, the content, the programming changes, it wasn't seen as highly valuable before. And it's even with the, the trying to redesign it with community input still wasn't hitting the mark, um, which is all concerning. We've seen um, uh, that reflected in ticket sales declining. Um, but I just want to be very clear. I think this is a product issue, not a Drupal issue because camps have been on the rise year over year in Europe as people are finding different ways to meet their needs. Um, so, you know, we're looking at this and we came to a conclusion that we do not want to just keep doing a rinse and repeat every year and, and just hoping it gets better. Um, we need to have a serious rethink and um, a different operational model that focuses on sustainability as well as value. Um, and so here is what's happening. Um, we're taking a pause of DrupalCon in 2018. We are working on a new operational model. We think it should be a licensed model. We're exploring that. And we want to find um, an entity that's grounded in the community uh, to take on DrupalCon Europe in 2019, then we would license it to them. And I have a committee of uh, European um, of, uh, event organizers helping me to think this through and get feedback. And we do have some entities that are considering this. So we're working with them to test this concept. Uh, at the end of the day, DrupalCon Europe is important. It brings all kinds of people together from different countries, different personas, the business side, the developer side, and it breaks down barriers and allows very unique and very needed um, cross-pollination of ideas. And also it's a huge engine for contribution. So I want you to know we are taking extreme care about DrupalCon Europe's future um, because we know how important it is. And um, I'm, I'm excited for the progress we're making there. Um, and we'll keep everyone up to date what's happening there. Uh, meanwhile, the community in Europe feels strongly that something does need to happen in 2018. Um, they understand that the Drupal Association from a capacity standpoint can't have this big rethink and produce a DrupalCon at the same time. Um, that's actually been the problems. We haven't had time to slow down to really think this through in a bigger um, holistic way. So, you know, we can't hold DrupalCon in 2018, but the community feels strongly that it is held, something is held, that 
does a couple things. One, allows for that cross-pollination of different personas and people from different countries, but it also needs to be an MVP and really experiment and try different things. Um, there's a group that stepped up. Um, they've been putting out medium posts. Um, there's, um, you know, maybe about 12 people in that group and there's so many more volunteers. And I really am incredibly impressed with the progress they're making, trying to figure out how to bring this event together. Um, and um, I definitely support them moving in that direction. They have a lot to figure out and um, they're going to need support. And so what I'd like to just say about this is, um, DrupalCon or Drupal Europe 2018 is important. And since there isn't a DrupalCon that year, if you were sponsoring DrupalCon Europe, I, I ask if you will support this group and what they are doing with sponsorship dollars. Um, I think it is um, not just admirable, but um, very impressive that they want to come together and try new things and try this MVP approach. Um, so I do have an appeal asking you to support them with your sponsorship dollars. Um, and that brings me just to uh, a big question that's come up, especially for supporters in Europe. Um, one of the things that people have asked me is, wait, I'm confused if I'm, if you're not having a DrupalCon in Europe and I'm giving money to the Drupal Association, what am I funding? Because I don't want to just fund DrupalCon North America. And we don't want that either. <laughs> we want to make sure people are very clear where their money's going and that they feel good about the investments that they're making. So I wanted to break it down for everyone. Those that are sponsoring an individual and or uh, those that have an individual organization membership, they're paying about 30 to 100 US dollars. Um, that money is funding community grants. That means um, we uh, give money to the community cultivation group. Uh, it's a committee of community members. They receive requests from camps from Nigeria and the Philippines and China and gosh, um, different places in South America. And they provide 500 to about 1500 US dollars to these camps so that they can start growing. Um, because, you know, it takes a while to get sponsorships, especially when you're uh, in new markets, new emerging places. Um, so the other thing that they fund are scholarships to bring people from around the world to DrupalCon. So this year, as an example, scholarships will be used to bring Europeans and Africans, um, South Americans, right, people from all over the world to DrupalCon in North America. Um, and so it's not funding DrupalCon North America. It's funding these kinds of programs. And I just wanted to be clear about that. Also, you as supporting partners, just so you know where your money's going when you renew every year, that is only to Drupal.org, which as you know, supports the whole world, including all of Europe and 44% of contributions coming from Europe. So, you know, you can feel good knowing that your money is definitely supporting your, your region as well as the world. Um, and again, it is only going to Drupal.org. And then, of course, event sponsorship goes to the event you're sponsoring, right? It, it helps um, fund that conference. So if you are sponsoring DrupalCon North America, it's going to DrupalCon North America. If you are funding Drupal Europe 2018, it's funding that event. So I hope that chart helps. And if you have questions, please let me know. And again, we are working with our a financial company to come up with better weather reports that really break it down and make it easy and digestible. So you don't have to just look at PLs that don't really answer the questions you may have. All right, if there's no questions, then um, why don't I hand it over to you, Tim, and I can just drive the slides. Drive the slides. Great, thanks, Megan. Um, first of all, I'd just like to repeat the thanks to all of you as supporting partners who um, fund that the work we do on Drupal.org and my team specifically. If you go to the next slide, Megan, um, this is the engineering team that works on Drupal.org every day. Um, and that's not everyone who adds value there, of course, because we have the people who manage membership and communications and all sorts of other things that happen on Drupal.org and other channels. 
But in terms of the, the features that support the business community and the developer community, um, I just thought it would be good to put some faces with names uh, of people you see in the issue queue um, who, who um, rely on your support to be able to do what we do for the community. Um, if you keep going, Megan. Um, one of the changes that we made in the last quarter um, relating to the adoption journey and promoting Drupal to evaluators and to um, also just saying thank you to, to you all as supporters is that we've added a second row of case studies here um, to the front page of Drupal.org, which are partner and contributor case studies that we feed from um, current supporting partners or from people who are sort of top of the contribution rankings in the marketplace. Um, so we encourage you, if you're a supporting partner and you don't yet have any case studies on Drupal.org um, and you'd like to eventually participate in this program, a good first step is of course, just getting those case studies up and then um, you know, we'll reach out to you as we're working on um, rotating through these slots. But we're really happy about this because it helps center some of the critical stories about uh, the success of Drupal um, right up front on the homepage um, and really, really promote that to the community at large. Um, next. Um, another thing that we've done is we've made some updates to the Drupal.org industry page um, landing page. Um, so this is the um, uh, the page where we describe the value of Drupal solutions in different vertical markets. So our, the four that we have right now are healthcare, higher ed, media and publishing and government, and we'll be working on others uh, going forward. Um, we've just updated this a little bit, um, again, to, to promote those pages, but also to promote uh, kind of the uh, whole cross section of different hosting partners and hosting solutions that can be um, uh, part of a complete solution. So that's just a, a small update to that page that we think will help evaluators find the right, um, right solutions for their needs. Uh, next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the healthcare page is one of the pages, uh, one of the solution industry solution pages that we're promoting right now. It's the latest one to be released. So it talks about some great stories um, about uh, uh, success in healthcare uh, using Drupal as a solution. And we're just proud to get this next one um, live and ready to go. And um, yeah, we'll be following it up with a few more uh, industry solution pages soon. Um, another small change that we made is that we, uh, on the download and extend page, we're now featuring uh, community faces and community stories with an appeal for uh, membership. Um, so you can see here we have uh, Fatima talking about the, the, um, her participation in the community and the, the value of Drupal, just not just as, a, as an open source project, but as a community of people who come together to build something pretty incredible. Um, we're rotating through different faces and stories, and we think this is a great way to, to reach out to people who aren't yet involved and to get them um, more involved in the project. Um, as far as the contribution journey goes over the last quarter, we've made a few changes as well. Um, for, um, for all of our project maintainers of contrib projects or core projects um, who work on Drupal.org, we've uh, automated the process of making sure that they get issue credit if they, whenever they commit um, an RTBC issue to their projects. Um, so that just streamlines that whole process and makes sure that all of our, uh, any, anyone who maintains a module, um, whether that's an organization or an individual contributor, um, is getting the credit um, that they deserve for that, that hard work that they do for us as a community. Um, we also have um, updated the testing system with a variety of new features that I think really help. Um, one of them sort of reduces a significant portion of the kind of the busy work that can go into doing code review on Drupal.org, which is we now generate an automatic um, code style fix patch in the test results. So instead of having to sort of go in and manually correct your um, uh, uh, periods and, and semicolons and extra spaces and all that kind of stuff, that uh, a patch is just immediately generated. And we're working um, as a next step to automatically apply that back to the code and back into the issue queue just to reduce that busy work and, um, and increase the, the velocity of the developer community in general. Um, one thing that we'd like to do as a future step, um, although there isn't really low hanging fruit here, is we want to take advantage of um, providing contribution credit for um, contributions that occur outside of Drupal.org. So that means if you're a camp organizer, uh, if you organize sprints, if you're a mentor, 
um, we want to find ways to recognize those contributions on Drupal.org as part of our contribution marketplace. Um, there's no low hanging fruit here, as I say, we need to um, do some work to make this possible in terms of providing an authentication endpoint so that people can um, uh, integrate that on their camp registration sites and then send back information about who's fulfilling what roles at the camps and things like that. It's gonna take some work, but it's something we're looking into and we just wanna let you all know that we're, it's important to us to recognize these contributions coming from individuals and organizations that happen outside of just the official Drupal.org channels. Um, I also wanted to provide a short update on project creation. As, um, as you probably know, about six months ago, we changed the way that project creation works on Drupal.org. It used to be the case that you had to put in a project application um, and wait for a group of volunteers to do a sort of manual review before um, a project was approved to be, become a full project on Drupal.org. And um, about six months ago, we changed that so that any, um, any confirmed user can now just go ahead and create full projects. And um, we added new project signals on Drupal.org so that uh, it, the evaluators of those modules can see whether or not they're participating in security advisory coverage or other things. And we're really pleased with how those changes have gone. We're monitoring it very carefully because uh, the quality and security of Drupal modules is really important. And that's something we wanted to keep an eye on. But so far, we're really just seeing positive signals. So there was, in the six month period following this change, we saw a 50, 58%, almost 60% increase in the rate of project creation on Drupal.org. Anecdotally, I've seen projects come back that had been you know, so frustrated with the application process that they just didn't host their code on Drupal.org. They left it up on GitHub or they didn't contribute it back at all. And now those, those uh, modules are there for the rest of the community to take advantage of. So we're really pleased with that change. Um, next slide. Um, let's hear. The other note on that front, just to, just to give everyone uh, some insight into this, right? The, the major concern there would be, oh, if we have more projects, do we have more projects that just don't receive security advisory coverage? Uh, we are keeping an eye on that. Uh, the rate of change for, for those projects um, is only about half a percent um, increase over, the, over about a six month period uh, for, for full projects that don't have coverage but do have more than 50 sites using them. So that's, the, that's kind of our risk vector um, and that's pretty small. So we're, we're pleased with that and we're continuing to work with the security working group on other steps that would help address um, this concern. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the changes we were making as, as, as part of uh, revamping how project creation works is to change the signals for evaluators of projects so that they can better understand which projects to use. Um, so this is what uh, a mature project page looks like for uh, it, the project information that's provided. Uh, so for example, you have your usage information, you have an indication about security coverage, you have the recommended release, and you have recent test results and uh, a, a link to the development version for developers or contributors who might be interested in the project. If you look at the next slide, that'll, this shows you what it looks like when a project is still in development. So again, you see usage information, you see a warning that the project is not yet participating in security advisory coverage. And uh, instead of a recommended release, you simply see just development versions. So we, we wanna make it really clear which projects are mature and ready for use and which projects are still, still rolling, still getting up to speed. Um, if we keep going, uh, one more thing that we did, Composer is obviously in a, a huge part of modern workflows, especially in Drupal 8. Um, and so um, we want to, and, and of course, if you're using Composer to build a Drupal site, you aren't necessarily looking at Drupal.org project pages, and therefore you don't necessarily see information about whether a particular release is included in security advisory coverage or not. So to make this uh, easier and to support automated tools that parse this information, we have added security coverage metadata in the Composer facade for all Drupal.org projects. So as you can see in this slide, the next one, and the next one, um, there's now security coverage status information that is exposed to Composer for all the projects hosted on Drupal.org. Um, if we continue, um, another thing I'd love to talk about, um, one of the biggest things that um, we do as the Drupal.org engineering team is we support testing for the project and making sure that, uh, you know, regression testing so that changes to core are known to work in all the environments that we support so that Contrib works with the latest development versions of core 
And really, it's a, um, again, it's another way to increase velocity for the development of the project as a whole. Um, I just want to give some stats because it's kind of incredible how much we do. I, I'm not aware of any other project that is as robust with um, the level of testing and test coverage that um, the Drupal community holds as a standard. Um, so, so far in 2017, we're up almost 17% year over year in terms of the number of complete test runs. That's over 200,000 test runs. And each of those full runs within it may have up to 80,000 individual test assertions. So it's just a tremendous, unbelievable amount of testing. Um, and uh, your so a supporter dollars help us fund all of these tests that keep this code quality um, as high as it is. Um, we're also starting to see this reflected in um, changes in the, the landscape. We're seeing Drupal 7 tests decline as Drupal 7 modules kind of roll off into mostly just maintenance mode and, and the attention really refocuses on Drupal 8 contrib and on those modules getting really up to speed. A lot of them are moving from beta to stable release and, and just really getting um, uh, fully up and running. And I think we've seen that reflected uh, not just anecdotally, but also in our testing data um, that, that D8 is really taking over contrib attention. If you go to the next slide, Megan. Um, so one thing that we did just because um, uh, the testing is such a critical part, um, we, you'll notice at the bottom of this uh, image, uh, underneath the files table and the test results table and issues, we now promote Drupal Association membership. Um, and um, we may promote direct sponsorship of uh, Drupal CI and testing for the project in the future. So just wanted to give you a kind of preview of what that looks like. Next slide. Um, another feature related to testing. Again, I, I talked about coding standards earlier. Um, we, now, we also parse code standards information. So um, uh, again, just to make sure that, um, especially for contrib maintainers or people who are making some of their first contributions, we really want to surface those harder to learn barriers to contribution, like remembering how to get the exact coding standards and, and things like that, right up into the test results um, where they're immediately there and immediately available to be fixed. So we added coding standards parsing to the test results. Um, next slide. Another thing that we've done that we're really, really proud of because we think, again, it's gonna really help contrib, keep up with core. Um, as you know, Core is now on a six month release cycle. So we have a new point release of Drupal every six months um, with perhaps new experimental modules, new stable modules, um, with um, different you know, additional new APIs available and things like that. And if you're working in the contrib space, you have to keep up with these changes every six months with your module and with your testing. And previously, um, if you maintain a, a, an integration on Drupal.org, you'd have to go in and reconfigure your testing to say, oh, 8.4 kid just came out, so now I need to swap things around, so I'm testing for 8.5 coming up. What we've done is we've added semantic labels. So now you just say, I want to test against the development version of Drupal. So in this case, you know, 8.5x dev. And then if a six month release happens, that'll now automatically update. So your testing configuration will chase the current state of core without you having to remember to go in and maintain and update your, your testing for the modules that you might maintain. Um, next slide. Yeah, and I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, we have some more uh, updates in the Drupal.org panel at DrupalCon Vienna. I don't know if that recording is available yet, but um, you can sort of certainly take a look for that or reach out to me. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in chat or in the Q&A panel. Be happy to answer them. Uh, or you can reach out to me. I'm Hestinet on Drupal.org, um, and you can use my contact form and get in touch. That's great. Thanks, Tim. Did any questions come up in the chat window? Nope. Looks like we're all good for the moment. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for um, listening in, but mo more importantly, I want to thank you for supporting the work that Tim's doing. That was a, a long list of um, improvements that he's making both in terms of trying to connect businesses with the evaluators on the site and also improving the contribution journey and, and providing the right tools and support that our community needs to keep the project moving forward and um, you know I'm just really excited about future things that they have coming up um, Dries, the Dries note talked a lot about 
where we need to go next um, and what markets we're going into um, and how there are some people being left behind. So it's like we want to go into ambitious digital experiences and we're going to need Composer to support some of that work. But some people are in other markets and they're downloading Drupal and they need um, support in kind of being able to still build a site more manually. And so we're looking at that. Um, and then of course, you know, the issue credit system, the, the, the one that calculates um, contribution by individual and then it aggreg aggregates it by company. Um, you know, that was built by Tim and his team. And that's how we know by studying that, that's how we know that, like, for example, Europe contributes 44% of um, contributes 44% of contribution, right? So it's a great tool, but the fact that we can start expanding that to support non-technical contributions, really, it's really key. And also I know that businesses are often behind camps and so they should get recognition in more ways than just um, contribution or financial support as a supporting partner. Anyhow, I'm just really so thankful for everything that Tim and his team is doing, and it couldn't be done without the supporting partners funding their work. So thank you so much. If you have questions, um, reach out. Of course, you can always reach out to me, but you also have your account managers. Um, you can ping us anytime on Twitter. Um, and of course, be on the lookout for our monthly email updates. Tim writes those every month to give you a summary of what's the latest work on Drupal.org that you just funded. So um, anyhow, thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to talking to you again by the end of the year. Thank you, everyone. Maybe just gonna not sure how to stop this. Mm -hmm.